all questions to be written in the chat and or they can be sent to me privately in the chat and I will relay the questions to Sister Marcia. We're also asking that all questions be relevant so they're based on the topic that Sister Marcia is um, speaking on today. So we're going to open with a quick prayer and then go straight into the presentation and hand over to Sister Marcia. So let's bow our heads. Um, Heavenly Father, I thank you for bringing everybody here um, back on Zoom safely. Please be with those who are still trying to log in or are on their way. I pray that this presentation will be a blessing, that the Holy Spirit will please come and abide with us, um, speak to our hearts and to our minds, that we will make um, significant changes in our lives and our lifestyles. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just want to thank you, Gabriella, uh, the Health Ministries Leader of Hampstead Seventh-day Adventist Church. Thank you for inviting me again. I remember when you invited me, I was like, what, already? And you guys, well, we haven't heard you in weeks. So thank you for your vote of confidence. Um, good day for everyone who's listening. For those of you who don't know me, uh, Gabriella invited me in the, as a practicing professional medical herbalist. And uh, this is her part of how to be series that the church has been putting on. So for this afternoon, we're looking at how to be eating for victory. Now, those of you who are old enough, for those of you, of you who are history buffs, you'll recognize that what I've got up on the screen here are cookery books, two of the popular cookery books that were circulating around World War II. And that was the actual titles of that book. And in fact, historians say that the diet in World War II was actually key for victory in England. And that sets the context of what we'll be talking about today. So um, again, for the history bars, very quickly, food rationing was introduced in World War II in January 1940. And the reason this took place was because the German U-boats were attacking ships containing food that were going to the UK. So it was Hitler's idea to sort of starve the Brits. Um, because of that, the first foods that were actually rationed, interestingly enough, were um, bacon, uh, butter, ham, and sugar. Then later, other flesh foods were rationed such as fish and meat, then dairy and poultry and jam. And at that time, uh, books like these came out, like um, typical contents for steaming and boiling veg and puddings, tips on how to use and prepare green vegetables. I don't need to tell anyone here about the times in which we are living, that we are facing the battle of our lives, the most significant warfare, where it's not for land or it's not for uh, the control of territory and uh, world superpower. The stakes are that much higher. It is the stakes for our souls. And this warfare, you, you, anyone alive, particularly Christians, and in particular, Seventh-day Adventist Christians, you all know that this warfare is quickly reaching its climax. And again, food is going to be key. I want you to notice the title. It's not what to eat for victory, but how to. So to get into this, so this context, 
in which we will be looking at uh, this topic. Once we've looked at it and set the context more concretely, we'll then be looking at, uh, well, exactly that. How are we going to do that? But it's not going to be my words. We are going to look and see how God has prepared his people in advance, way in advance of anything um, science or anyone uh, has done. So I'd like you to turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 21. And I'll be reading in your hearing verses 25 to 28 and then verse 20, verse 36. So it's Luke chapter 21, which is Jesus's treatise on the last days. And I'll be reading from verse 25 to 28 and then verse 36. Right, so verse 25 of Luke chapter 21. And there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. 28. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draws nigh. Verse 36, watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Perplexity, our leaders are, are perplexed. We are perplexed would be just all sorts of things are happening, pestilences, uh, unrest of nations. We are really living in that time. But what is the admonition from Jesus? He says, look up. And when you look up, when we look up, what do we see? Well, looking up, we see God. And where is God? He's in the sanctuary. So what we're looking at, we look, while all this is going on, on earth, perplexity of nations, distress, confusion, uh, loss of trust in our leadership. What's happening when you look up? You look up and you see Jesus as our high priest ministering in the sanctuary. Friends, brothers and sisters, this is the secret. Look up, see what Jesus is doing. Psalm 77, 13, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? So I'm going to read something to you from the well-known writer, Ellen G. White, in the book, Great Controversy. Because, all right, so we see Jesus in the sanctuary, but what is he doing right now? As this crazy confusion going on? Well, we all know that right now is what we as Seventh-day Adventists say is the period of the real Day of Atonement. What used to happen in the Jewish dispensation was just a type of what is happening now. So Great Controversy, page eight, um, page 419. Every man or everyone was required to afflict his soul while this work of atonement was going forward. And the whole congregation of Israel were to spend the day in solemn humiliation before God with prayer fasting and deep searching of heart. Now that was required of the type. We are now living in the reality. 
So that period of time was spent with prayer, fasting, and deep heart searching. This is taken from manuscript release. The true fasting, which should be recommended to all, so this is the true fast, in the time in which we're living, which is now, the true fasting is abstinence from every kind of stimulating food and the proper use of wholesome, simple food, which God has provided in abundance. So it's interesting, isn't it? We all are aware that at the very time that God was going to reveal this unique dodging of the sanctuary, he also gave the light of the health message to the Advent people. They needed to have a reformation and understanding of the importance of health and their diet in order to understand what the significance of what was happening in the Day of Atonement, the time which is now. It was also to enable, it is also what Jesus is doing to enable us to receive the latter reign of the Holy Spirit. Because the gospel of the kingdom, the everlasting gospel, which is summarized in the three angels message, is that of the good news of how God wants to save us and has saved us from sin and to reflect his perfect character to the rest of the world, that they may be part of it. So it says, you are God's temple. That's take, that thought is taken from Corinthians. Jesus is ministering in the temple right now above the affairs of what's going on in the world. He's ministering through his Holy Spirit in the body temple but just as the people then had to pray and fast we are required to do the same and i and as we read before it was in the context of eating wholesome simple food here's a really interesting text um that's found in ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 17, and I've got it up there. It says, blessed art thou, O land, when thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. Now that's really strange. I'll tell you why I thought it was strange. Because it doesn't say drink for drunkenness. It's talking about eating and getting drunk from food and not from alcohol. What does this mean? Well, something from um, Christian education. Uh, Ellen White writes, the brain is a citadel of the whole man. Wrong habits of eating or sleeping affects the brain, bearing in mind that our brain is the organ of communication from us to God, from the Holy Spirit back to us. Wrong habits of eating or sleeping affects the brain. Another quote, and we'll be hearing lots. And the reason I, I put lots in is because we don't actually hear enough. We recognize that as a church, we are blessed with light abundant light but we don't and we're not going to get this light from anywhere else from any other church from any other pulpit and we need to use this because this is information from our hq in this warfare so councils on um testimonies councils on temperance and bible hygiene page 53 those who indulge in species of intemperance whether in eating or drinking waste their physical strength energies weaken moral 
power. Hey, we're talking about moral power. We're talking about the law here. This one um, is interesting, child guidance. There are few who realize as much as they should, how much their habits of diet have to do with their health, number one. Their character, number two. Usefulness in this world, number three and their eternal destiny. There are few of us who realize how much of my habits has to do with my eternal destiny. And this one, uh, I'm, I'm making a point here. So I just need you to stay with me. Maybe put down some of these quotes and see them more fully, because I really believe these are relevant and everything we say is in the light of what is in the light and in cooperation of what Jesus is doing right now in the sanctuary, in preparing us for the final onslaught of what is happening in the world. So priceless gems are to be found in the word of God. Those who search this word should keep the mind clear. If the brain is confused, they will be unable to bear the strain of digging deep to find out the meaning of those things which relate to the closing scenes of this earth's history. Now, we are seeing lots of things happening. A lot of things that happen around us don't really make sense. The uh, videos that we see that come that fall into our inboxes, the news reports, the claims and counterclaims, the theories and counter theories and conspiracy theories. If we do not, we won't understand. You open your Bible, you can't even, you won't even be able to understand the relevance of the last few chapters in Revelation to what's actually happening and to what's been said and done. If we do not keep our minds clear, how do we keep our minds clear? Um, Philippians 2, 2 Timothy 1, verse 7, in the interest of time, I won't be reading them because we've got quite a lot to get through, but it says, to have your mind clear, to understand what's going on right now and what is about to happen, we need to have the mind of Jesus. Those two texts explain what that, what it means to have the mind of Jesus. It's have a mind of humility, a mind of power, of love a sound mind without any fear. Fear, I read to you in Luke 21, characterizes our age. Men's heart failing them for fear. And unless you look up, unless we do look up and behold Jesus and his closing work on our behalf, we will succumb and fall for anything and everything. So that's the mind of Jesus. That's the only way, unless we have the mind of Jesus, we will be able to um, understand what's going on. I looked up the word in the Greek. Uh, what does it mean to have uh, a sound mind? That's coming from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, the spirit of love the spirit of power and of sound mind. So if God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, men's heart failing them for fear, we know where that's coming from. It's not coming from God. It's coming from his arch enemy, the devil. We don't want this. So a sound mind in the Greek, and I put it up there on the screen, is a mind that is disciplined, a self-controlled mind. This, I find, is significant. Because we understand when we read the book of Revelation that all the nations are drunk. They're drunk with the wine of the wrath of Babylon. So a sound, disciplined, controlled mind is quite the opposite of a drunken mind. A drunken mind is, has no judgment. A drunken mind has no coordination. A drunken mind does not understand and it is God's desire 
for us to have a sound mind to discern the lies and deceptions of Satan, which are increasing. Now, those of you who, are, who have read the book of um, Exodus and Leviticus, you will know that the whole purpose of the sanctuary that God said, uh, gave instructions to be built was to house right within the heart of the earthly sanctuary was where God communicated with his people was God's law. So the purpose of the sanctuary right in the heart of it was God's law, the Ten Commandments. And that should be no surprise to you that right with, within our hearts, according to the Bible, we've got um, Hebrews 8 verse 10 and Hebrews 10, 16, that God uh, has written his law on our hearts, right within the human temple. So uh, just as, as his presence was just above the Ark of the Covenant, uh, where the law was, and as God communicated with his people of old. So God wishes to communicate to us his will with the laws that are written within our hearts in the body temple. Now, here's another interesting quote, this time from Christ Object Lessons, written by Ellen G. White. And she says, transgression of physical law, and by this she's talking about the laws of health. Transgression of physical law is transgression of the moral law. For God is as truly the author of physical laws as he is the author of the moral law. Do you get that? When we break any of the physical laws of health, it we, is just as much in God's sight as breaking the moral laws. And therefore, um, one of the things that I do in practice is that one of the first things we do when I'm with a health seeker is let us pray and ask God forgiveness for how and why you are ill. Oh, but I've got blood pressure. Oh, it's in my family. Oh, yeah, but it's a transgression of a law. It might have been something you inherited. We still, the first step towards healing is to ask forgiveness for the transgression. Forgive me, God, for this illness that I had for the part I may have played in that illness. Yeah, carrying on with this quote, God's law is written with his own finger upon every nerve, every muscle, every faculty of man, and every misuse of any part of our organism is a violation of that law. So God's law, God has written his law of health in our very DNA. Now, here's this term. I know this is really for the medics, but we're going to get into this in a little bit. Neurogastroenterology. This is a term that's kind of one of the new kids on the block in, in medicine these days. It comes under lots of names. But this is what this is kind of one of those hot uh, new sciences. It's a branch of gastroenterology and it's called neurogastroenterology. Guys, ladies, gentlemen, you've been there. You've done that. You know all about it. Shall I show you why? Here we go. Yeah, that's right. Inspiration says in Councils on Diet, the stomach is related to the brain respect paid to the proper treatment of the stomach will be rewarded in clearness of thought and strength of mind okay let's get this look after my stomach i won't have brain fog i will have clear thinking and my i will have a powerful mind to understand the deceptions and the lies under which the whole world is shortly if not now 
being held captive just by respecting my stomach. This is neurogastroenterology. Stay with me. Oh, oh, here, sorry, yep, still stay. Uh, she goes on to write in Cancers and Diet, I regard it as my duty to refuse to place in my stomach any food that I have reason to believe will create disorder. Why? My mind must be sanctified to God. I must carefully guard against any habit that would tend to lessen my powers of intellect. So here we have the servant of the Lord writing that by eating improper food, she would be lessening her powers of intellect. If men and women in councils of diet, page 111, if men and women would only remember how greatly they afflict the soul when they afflict the stomach and how deeply Christ is dishonored when the stomach is abused. If we only knew that, but you only remember that they would be brave and self-denying, giving the stomach opportunity to recover its action. So here we have, this is what gastro, neurogastroenterology is all about. The link between your stomach and what you put into it and your mind. Now, this would have been nonsense. It would have been like, uh, like maybe 50 years ago. But um, there are other traditions. Uh, like the Ayurvedic medicine, the Ayurvedic medics, they would say things like, well, you know, if you've got a healthy stomach, you, uh, no, if your stomach is not healthy, no medicine will help. But if your stomach is healthy, you don't need any medicine. That was in the Ayurvedic tradition, that's thousands of years old. But Western medicine has only just caught on to this idea. So 160 years later, science catches on to what inspiration has already given God's church. You know, we know that inspiration does not stoop to science. So unfortunately, many of us, unless it's in the literature first, uh, then, we only, then we'll believe what inspiration has said. Uh, 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 uh. Inspiration is way ahead of science and will always be. Sometimes you wait for science, it's too late. So what does neurogastroenterology Let's define it. 160 years later, in comes this uh, branch of medicine. Study of the brain, the gut. It is the study of the brain, the gut, and how they interact as to affect your physical health and well being. Yeah, right. Your emotions, feelings, and cognitive ability. That's the ability to think, to reason, to remember, to plan. To connect to God. That's what we have. We are now, that's what I say we, science is now looking into how the brain, the gut, my digestive system, how they interact to affect my physical health, well being, my emotions and feelings, and cognitive ability. Here's something from the journal Biological Psychiatry. 2015, a few years ago, it says a typical Western diet, high in saturated fats and sugars, A, changes the mix of bacteria in the gut, the microbiome, which appears, so when you change the gut, it appears to affect the brain, including cognitive ability, memory, and increased anxiety. So in 2015, Psychiatry is now saying, hello, the diet, Western diet affects the brain, affects my ability to think, increases anxiety. As a church, we already knew that. Carries on to say, B, it also causes inflammation in the brain. This could lead to depression and other psychiatric disorders. Today we know now that Alzheimer's is an inflammatory uh, activity in the brain. We also know that neuroinflammation is one of the characteristic symptoms of autism. 
which it is itself is become an epidemic amongst children. That's 160 years later, science is beginning to cotton on to the information that Jesus, through his servant, had given his church specifically to enable us to understand what's happening so that we will not be part of the confusion of Babylon that's going around. Here's another quote. I'm just going to give you a few quotes just to show you that how science has always backed up. True science always backs up the truth because it, it, it is the book of Revelation. Uh, neurotransmitters, so these are um, chemicals in the brain that mediates our mood, mediates our thinking. So neurotransmitters are active in the gut as well as in the brain. What, do they, what are they doing? Like serotonin and the, the dopamine and uh, noradrenaline and um, uh, GABA. All these are neurotransmitters in the brain. And we know they make you chilled or they stimulate your mind in your thinking or they make you happy. What are they doing in the, what are they doing in our digestive system? Well, here is the answer. According to the Journal of Cell Physiology, Cell physiology, they regulate blood flow in your digestive system. They influence gut motility, how fast your gut works. They influence how well you absorb your nutrients. And very importantly, they influence the gut immune system and the microbiome. Remember there's bacteria that are so key to our survival. Now, this is important because you must be aware by now that in the tiny proportion of people who unfortunately succumbed to COVID, it was the person's immune system that freaked out, that damaged their lungs and ultimately took their lives. So the emphasis sh should be on uh, regulating and improving the immune system since it was the immune system not the covid virus but the immune system that proved to be lethal and that's in the journal of cellular physiology right just another one not too many but i really want to labor this point because i want you to have confidence in the light that god has given us because this is the light that's going to carry us through where we will not be partakers of um, the deception and the confusion that's happening around us. So neuro, neuro therapeutics journal says there is a close interaction between the gut microbiota, that's the friendly good guys, bacteria and our tummies and our digestive system. So there's a close, basically this is saying there's a close interaction between the bacteria in our gut and our hormonal system. So not only our nervous system, our brain, but our hormonal system, the major neuroendocrine system that regulates, hello, stress responses to stress and their communication may be closely interrelated with other systems. This is important brothers and sisters. Now we are beginning to understand more and more why God in his infinite wisdom and mercy and compassion has given his people the light of the health message at the same time, he gave the light of the sanctuary doctrine that heaven and earth, the Holy Spirit, God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in heaven, and work in cooperation with us on earth to the finishing up of the work of salvation in our lives and to others. This is the reason why looking young, feeling great, are they just um, byproducts? That's what it's that's not what the health message is about. All right, so that's just more. Uh all right, I just wanted to share this. Perhaps this is the last one. Uh showing the connection, the close connection between the gut and the brain axis. So what is it for? It's for the I beg your pardon, I keep changing it. Yeah, here we go. 
Signals along the gut-brain axis can originate either in the gut, the brain, or the both. Into, all right. And why are that? Why is there this gut-brain axis? It is for the objective of maintaining normal gut function and appropriate behavior. That's why there's this signaling between what we eat and our behavior. That's what it's all about, appropriate behavior, which is, again, we see that in a lot of uh, people, um, a lot of people with mental health problems or children with autism and other things that also have uh, a lot of gut problems. There's something else I was going to say, but it has slipped my mind. Uh, so, but I just want to say that, uh, I'll say that when we come to it. What we're going to look at is what we call the nuts and bolts of self-assessment. Now, what I'm going to do, I've got a series of about 10 questions. And um, I just want you to, as I've put up there, say how many of the following statements do you agree with and do you practice? So we're not looking at what to eat for victory. We're looking at how. And so this is what these statements are about. Just count up maybe how many of the 10 that you actually agree with. And we'll have a short discussion uh, because I know uh, you would probably put in your questions uh, about it. So are we ready? Let's begin. Question number one, how and when I eat is in just as important as what I eat. So you agree, disagree. How and when I eat is just as important as what I eat. Hopefully you agreed. We have in councils on diet where uh, Ellen White says a serious evil is eating at improper times, like as after violent or excessive exercise, or when one is much exhausted or heated, when mind or body is heavily taxed just before or just after eating, digestion is hindered. When one is excited, anxious or hurried, it is better not to eat. So these are when we should not eat. Very, very quickly, when you are violent exercise, not, you know, big exercise, or when you're exhausted, or when you're heated, when your mind or body, you have what we call the arousal of the sympathetic nervous system, and that system shuts down digestion and all the benefits of digestion. And uh, well, that in itself is a whole nother talk. We won't go into that. Just suffice it to say, and you can always look it up. So how and when you eat is important. What about this one? I do not eat a variety of foods at any one meal. Agree, disagree? Well, let's see. Uh, all of these following statements are taken from the book, Councils of Councils on Diets and Health, um, which is written by Ellen G. White, a lovely compilation of, of uh, uh, what she said and the light that she was given and at a time when none of these sciences existed. She says the variety of food at any one meal causes unpleasantness and destroys the good which each article if taken alone would do the system. This causes constant suffering and often death, uh, think pot meals. So too much of any one food, too much mixtures of food at any one meal can uh, cause inflammation, uh, lots of things that go on, death because of illness that comes as a result, chronic. What about this one? I eat slowly and thoroughly chew my food. Not the cut and swallow that uh, a lot of us do because we always seem to be eating on the hot. All right, we should because 
counts uh this is uh councils on temperance and bible hygiene page 51 in order to secure healthy digestion ellen white says food should be eaten slowly those who wish to avoid dyspepsia and we'll be going into that uh, in a short while and those who realize the obligation to keep all their powers in a condition which enable them to render the best service to God will do well to remember to eat slowly and chew your food thoroughly. If all your powers, that's your muscular system, your nervous system, your brain, your digestive, all in a condition to render the best service to God, eat slowly, thoroughly chew your food. Regularity in meal times is important to me, true or false, agree or disagree. Regularity in eating is very important for health of body and serenity of mind. Never should a morsel of food pass the lips between meals. Brothers and sisters, if at all we believe where God says, hear ye his prophets, believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. Then we, we, this is where we should be aiming for our prayers. But let's carry on. I tend not to eat before bedtime. Agree, disagree, true or false. More. Many indulge in the pernicious habit of eating just before retiring. The digestive organs are put in motion again to perform the same round of labor through the sleeping hours. The sleep of such is often disturbed with unpleasant dreams and in the morning they awake unrefreshed. I don't need to go into all of this because now the whole internet is awash with the importance of not eating just before sleeping and sleep. Listen, the brain is such a busy overworked organ during the day that the only time the brain has to detoxify itself is when we are asleep. So we, shan't, we, we mustn't have food in the stomach. We must not divert the brain, energy that the brain will now need to detoxify itself into digesting food. Digestion has a heavy um, metabolic and energy requirement on the body. So the brain then in digesting your meal that you've eaten, just about like maybe half an hour before you go to bed, the brain can't detoxify itself. So all the toxins that are built up in the day before, it's still there. So you wake up, you're groggy, you've got brain fog, you're not thinking clearly, you're grumpy. Well, think. All right, here's the next one. It's best not to drink, to take drinks with milk. Many take, sorry, many make a mistake in drinking cold water with their meals. Food should not be washed down. The more liquid there is taken into the stomach with the meal, the more difficult it is for food to digest. For the liquid must first be absorbed. There isn't very much in science about this, but we are catching up. Um, the dilution of the digestive enzymes make it more difficult for digestion to take place. And of course, the absorption of all the liquid that must occur leaves food sloshing around in the stomach for longer than it should be. So the energy to digest is deplete. Now, these are very important, especially where there is chronic illness. If you, yeah, I mean, for those who are fit and healthy, your, our body can put up with a lot of abuse and compensate. But there comes a time in your life and then maybe there's extra stress, like the times in which we're living or just age or whatever it is, when there comes a point when the body no longer can compensate, then these laws become even more important. These physical laws of health that God has written on every cell of our body in our DNA. 
It's best not to eat and drink very hot or cold food. What does the servant of the Lord say in the book Ministry of Healing? Food should not be eaten very hot or very cold. If food is cold, the vital force of the stomach is drawn upon in order to warm it before the digest can, digestion can take place. Cold drinks are injurious for the same reason, while the free use of hot drinks is debilitating. Essentially, we all know, well, when I say we all know, uh, health practitioners know that um, before food can be digested and absorbed, it's got to be brought to body temperature, around 37 degrees. If it's much hotter or much colder, more energy has got to be used to either warm it up or bring down the temperature. Therefore, you need that energy. We need the energy not to uh, bring food to body temperature. We need the energy to heal the body, to help the immune system. So these are some of the reasons why. Now, it's possible to eat wholesome food and still impair digestive functions, of course. Too much of a good thing is good for nothing. We can overeat. Overeating, no matter what the quality of the food, clogs the living machinery, thus hinder it in its work. What about this one? It's possible to abstain from eating improper food and still not be nourished. So we've got people on the other extreme. They're not eating this, they're not eating that, and this is bad, and this gives cancer, and this does that. And you think, uh, well, what are you eating? Is it possible to go to the other extreme? Of course it is. Councils and diets, some of our people conscientiously abstain from eating improper food and at the same time neglect to eat the food that would supply the elements necessary for the proper sustenance of the body. So that's important that we don't, um, you know, uh, especially those fasting is excellent. One of the reasons why the British people were at their healthiest during food rationing was that they were eating a lot less. So not only were they eating lots more veg and not eating things like meat and dairy and eggs, they were eating less. But we have to eat enough. The immune system is constantly active and it needs energy to constantly survey and to um, attack and to defend us from viruses, bacteria, and other pathogens. I think this is the last one. We need not worry and be anxious about our diet. Well, worrying is not gonna help anything, is it? No. Some are continually anxious lest their food however simple and helpful, may hurt them. Have you met those people? Do not think that your food will injure you. Eat according to your best judgment. And when you have asked the Lord to bless the food for the strengthening of your body, believe that he hears your prayer and be at rest. I think that's beautiful. You know what? Many of us say grace, I suppose, just as a force of habit or as a ritual, but trust me, we're living in the times we ask to bless our food, we're asking for a repetition of the miracle of changing water into wine. We're asking God to help our bodies to um, be benefited from a lot of food that has been depleted in its nutritive value. So rounding up this section, and uh, we're, we're coming to our last bit, so in councils of diet says, while sitting at the table, we may do medical missionary work by eating and drinking to the glory of God. I've never thought of medical missionary as just simple as eating and drinking, but you know that when you eat and drink, particularly with your um, friends and family, they want to know well, why are you not eating this or why are you not doing that? 
you can glorify God in your eating and drinking. So we've looked at, um, we looked at the context of why we should be and how we should be eating, why we should be eating to glorify God, to give us the victory, to help our minds to be clear, to understand what's really going on in this world's history. And we've looked at some of the laws of health that God has given us that will enable us uh, to eat and drink to the glory of God. So we're now, this final section is how do we repair the damage to our body temple? I like to see it as, if you see the bucket on the left is, and if you see the water going into it as a gift of life and vitality, and the holes are, the lifestyle choices that we make, the poor lifestyle choices. So it doesn't matter how much you put in. If, um, if I'm not uh, obeying these laws of health, I'm still losing. The bucket will never reach its full capacity. However, if I try and do things, and this is what this section's about, I can, as it were, put plaster, I can sort of just dampen up the hole. I might not be able to get full restoration of health, but I can improve it greatly. After all, how many laws do you need to break to be considered a lawbreaker and to feel the repercussions or the consequences of broken law? How many traffic laws do you need to break before you get a fine? It just takes one but we can improve. So, when the abuse of health, Ministry of Healing, is carried so far that sickness results, the sufferer can do for himself what no one else can do for him. The first thing to be done is to ascertain the true character of the sickness and then go to work intelligently to remove the cause. Unhealthful conditions, and this is what we do, Number one, unhealthful conditions should be changed. Wrong habits corrected, number two. Then nature is to be assisted to reestablish right conditions in the system. So what we do when we're sick, we do it back to front. We rush to the doctor or go somewhere. No, first thing is, are you living in unhealthful conditions? Do you need to correct any damp in your home? Do you need to be in a more healthful environment? Do you need to cut down on the amount of chemicals that you're using in your home or condiments or artificial stuff? So unhealthful con conditions change. Number two, wrong habits corrected. We need to sleep regularly, eat regularly in the right way. We need to exercise. We need to observe the laws that God has written in our hearts. When you've done all of that, then go for assistance. Then uh, I was listening to a seminar a couple of days ago, I think it was yesterday actually, and the person was saying that doctors are actually impressed. They will listen to you more if you go to a doctor and says, well, look, doctor, I've done this. I've lost this amount of weight. I'm doing that. I'm doing that. Doctors are more willing to engage with you and will listen to you more when you become proactive in correcting wrong habits. So let's have a look. We, and I might spoke about the dyspepsia. Let's have a look at some of the symptoms. How do I know my digestion, my digestive system, something's wrong with it? Well, here are some of the symptoms, common, more common ones. Abdominal pain, if there's heartburn, anorexia, meaning not the psychiatric condition, but loss of appetite. Nausea, vomiting, early satiety after meals. So I, uh, that means you're... You eat two spoonful and you feel very full. And if there's bloating or flatulence, a lot of excessive wind are poured down. How do we treat it? Well, according to the light that we've been given, the cause should first be ascertained. And then you treat the cause along with the symptoms. Not enough just to, you know, people say, oh, what do you take for high blood pressure? Or what do you take for this? No. The cause 
should be ascertained. And you also, you deal with the cause as well as the treatment. Otherwise, you're not really helping. Now I'm gonna have a look at a couple of things and um, simple constipation. Now I say simple constipation uh, because there are very many causes. Uh, uh, one, of the, one of the main causes of constipation, funny enough, is laxative abuse. The repeated use of laxatives is one of the commonest causes of constipation where the digestive system loses its tone and is no longer able to form proper feces. Constipation can also be due to um, medication, it could be due to disease, so many causes. But I'm talk so when I mention simple, I'm, I'm talking about you don't have enough roughage in your diet or if you're not drinking enough water. Now what I have here are some herbs as this is my profession but I've got them in increasing order of laxatives. So the first thing we want to do is to stimulate the production of bile. The bile is the body's natural laxative. It's its own natural laxative that is formed in the liver, produced in the liver. And by gently, by working on the liver, liver, you produce more bile. And herbs that do this are things like dandelion root, white whorehound. That's the first line. The second line, which is slightly uh, a bit more, has a bit more laxative effect, are what we call bulk laxatives. And what these bulk laxatives do, they absorb water and they bulk out the, the stool and that sends impulses to the brain and it retrains the gut, makes the stool more bulky. And we have things like uh, psyllium seed husk, linseeds, I think chia seeds. So these are substances that are able to absorb a lot of water and create bulk. When you take things like linseeds, chia seeds and psyllium seeds, you've got to drink lots of water with it. Because if you don't, you get what we call impacted stool, which is another issue, which is a water with bulk laxatives. In fact, drinking water on its own is sufficient for most cases of simple constipation. Then we have what we call osmotic laxatives. And these are food that's rich in soluble fiber. That's most of your peas and beans and pectin in fruits, magnesium rich foods like bananas. So magnesium itself, the mineral is what we call a smooth muscle relaxant and it helps with constipation. If there is spasm, you know, griping pain, chamomile tea, excellent, will reduce that. Then when somebody, if someone's not gone for like, I don't know, days on end, um, practitioners don't like to use cathartic laxatives. That's sort of a last line defense, but sometimes you have to do it. And if you have to treat someone, you've got to get rid of all that gunk first. So we're looking at things like aloe. Now I've got aloes, not aloe vera. There is a difference. It's the same plant, but there's a part of the plant that, you, that is um, cathartic and there's a part that does something else in the digestive system. So aloes, castor oil, cascara, loads, loads and loads of um, cathartic. We use these sparingly and for a short period of time and as a last resort because we don't want the gut to lose its tone and not be able to form storm. Now, very quickly, again, treatment of simple diarrhea. Simple diarrhea is because you've ruled out, um, the, you've ruled out underlying diseases and what have you. So you, you probably went and had a mayonnaise sandwich, I don't know, from some shop and got a case of simple food poisoning or a little infection, or you've eaten something that your body doesn't agree with and your, and your digestive system thinks, right, I've got to get rid of it. So you've got diarrhea. Use of what we call astringent herbs. Um, astringent herbs, herb, you know what astringency is. If you've ever tasted um, 
black tea or unripe fruit. You've got this kind of tightening sensation in your mouth. That's astringent. And what that does, it calms down the digestive system, which has gone into overdrive, uh, what they call hyperperistalsis. And things like oak bark, the geranium, uh, uh, for, for children, rose petals, lovely, gentle treatment for diarrhea, agrimony, avoid caffeine, I, well, for those, for caffeine and alcohol. Now, the funny thing is, People, I remember people used to give children, um, is it Lucozade? Yeah, Lucozade when they're vomiting and they're losing, vomiting V and D, vomiting and diarrhea. But the caffeine itself creates more motions. So you avoid caffeine and alcohol, alcohol dehydrates. So you use astringent herbs and you also use calming herbs. We call them calminatives. And what they do, they decrease the activity of the gut. And you also want to increase absorption because when someone has diarrhea, they're not absorbing food. It's all going down the hatch, isn't it? Things like ginger, chamomile, fennel, caraway, and aniseed. Excellent herbs. I'm coming to an end now. You also want to use what we call demulcent herbs. Now, demulcent herbs are herbs that form a nice kind of a gooey cushion to calm the stomach down and also there is an infection to stop it spreading you'd need anti-inflammatory herbs for the gut such as golden seal meadow sweet and here we go again chamomile you know the germans called chamomile mother of the gut let me tell you something it is one of the most it's my most effective um, anti-inflammatory herbs we have for the digestive system. That's your number one go-to herb. Now, of course, if you're using chamomile tea bags, you'd need to put two, at least two or three bags to a, a cup of tea, a strong cup of tea, if you want to use it medicinally. And if the diarrhea is due to some sort of uh, food poisoning, you might need to use some antimicrobial herbs, such as golden seal and barberry. I'm going to finish up this section because I'm, I'm aware of the time that's going. I really am. Uh, I could talk about this for hours. This is my life work. Bitter herbs. There are so many uh, bitter herbs. So I'll go there. I'll, I'll, I'll go back to that slide. They're different. And many different. Any bitter herb will do this. Uh, the only property that this herb has to have is that it should taste bitter. In tasting bitter... Uh, bitter herbs stimulate the, the nerve, the gustatory nerve that carries signals to the brain. And what that does, that stimulates the digestive system. They're considered cooling remedies. They are mildly laxative. We're looking at herbs like aloe vera, aloe vera, which is the gel, just the gel part of the plant, the white bit, golden seal again, white whorehound, Swedish bitters and wormwood. So what do they do? Oh, I'm telling you, the, 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 they, very few, most herbalists, when they write a prescription, medical herbalists, they always include a bitter. They stimulate digestion. They stimulate the repair me mechanisms in the gut. So people have leaky guts because of whatever reasons, many reasons. I have time to go into that now. They stimulate the repair. They have a toning effect on the entire body via the autonomic nervous system, the vagus nerve. It enhances the mood. You, you won't know it until you try it. How many people are a bit, um, what we call it, not depressed, but you feel low and tell me about it. These are the times which, you know, you really need the power and presence of God not to be low. It enhances the mood. Now we know why. We knew it happened, but we didn't know the intimate connection, the, 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 the physiology behind the intimate connection between the gut and the neurotransmitters, transmitters, and it enhances clarity of the mind. So reflecting God, we so whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, let's do all 
to the glory of God. What is the glory of God? It's his character. What is the glory of his God? It's his mercy and grace to save us. Let us reflect this by eating or drinking according to the promise in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Our body, your body is a temple. Healthy food choices help prepare our bodies to serve him better. And so thank you for the time that you've um, been there for listening in. I just hope to, I just hope that I've inspired you to um, eat well. Time is short. We need to have clear minds. We need to get as many people out of Satan's grasp. The war is almost over. Victory has already been accomplished. Let's not trip up by being taken into the madness and confusion of Babylon. Let's not that happen, especially through our diet. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Over to you, Gabriella, because I know you've been collecting questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sister Marcia, for your presentation. Um, we have had uh, a few questions. Um, I'll start with... Uh, you mentioned about um, making sure foods and drinks were at body temperature. Uh, so someone has asked, is drinking very hot tea, is that going to be then bad for you if they like to drink hot tea? Well, very hot tea is, can damage the mucous membrane. Uh, the mucous membranes is a special layer of cells in our digestive system. Uh, we don't want them damaged because that's very important in the absorption of food. Uh, in the drinking of very hot, we're talk, I'm not talking about marginally hot, in the drinking of very hot or eating of very hot foods, the body needs to use energy to bring it down to room temperature. We should be conserving our energy for things, that, important things like healing. Great, thank you. Um, you mentioned with the bulk laxatives, um, the use of lime seeds. Is there a best way to use them? Should they be grounded before they're used or is it okay to yes, have them? Yes, yeah. Before? It's better to have it milled. You just put it in your blender. Yeah. Great. Um, what time should be uh, the last meal, I guess, before going to bed? Is there well, a best if time? it takes about four hours for digestion to be completed, the last meal should ideally be between uh, uh, three to four hours before your bedtime, or if you're, a, yeah, three to four hours before your bedtime. Uh, a lot of seas, a lot of um, night shift workers, they sleep first, they come home from the night shift, they sleep and they wake up and have something to eat. Mm. Great. Um, I think this was for just clarity. When you talked about the osmotic laxatives and you mentioned banana, is that ripe banana to be used? Yes. Right. Yes, right, banana. Uh, um, what is the best way to um, prepare the herbs that you've mentioned? In your Fantastic. Right. So um, if the medicinal part of the herb is mainly in the leaves or what we call the aerial part, the leaves, things that grow out of the, the ground, the best way to have them is, um, if you can dry them, is to pour hot water on them and have it as a tea. You don't boil leaves and things that, and stems that grow out of the ground. If the medicinal part is a root, like it grows and it grows under the ground, or if it's a bark, or if it's seeds, you boil those for about 15 minutes and leave to cool and then you drink it. Uh, the proportions, if it's dried herb, if it's dry, approximately 30 grams to a litre of hot water. That's a rule of thumb. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, 
how often should you take the bitters? I think it's talking about the bitter herbs. Right. Um, if someone has a, 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 a definite uh, digestive upset, you would take the bitters half an hour before your meal. Having said that, there are certain digestive conditions in which bitters are not to be used. Um, the next question is, how should we approach intermittent fasting? Uh, that's a really, really good question. Um, if you're not used to fasting, you should approach it very carefully, very cautiously, but it's one of the best things. And again, we've already had that light on that. So we're told by Spirit of Prophecy, we don't really need more than two meals a day, unless it's ex unless under exceptional circumstances. So you have your breakfast, and then you have your main meal, and that's it. For children, it's different. Children, they've got small stomachs. Well, there's some people with small stomachs. But um, I definitely recommend fasting. People, scientists have always known that you live longer, you live healthier when you fast. And sometimes, again, we've got light on that where, where you know, Ellen White says, sometimes all people need to do just to turn a disease around is to fast for one day. I know on the continent in Germany and in Europe, they fast people for um, up to 10 days under supervision, a fast for a week, a fast for three days. Anything less than three days is not gonna have very much therapeutic value, but it'd be very healthy for your digestive system. For three days, that bumps up the immune system like nothing else can do. The body just detoxifies itself. It clears away debris. Fasting is the way forward when it comes to health management. So approach it if you're not used to it by skipping a meal, skipping your evening meal. And then you can then decide to skip two meals, maybe the next week. And then you can take a 24 hour period. When you go into a fast, you don't junk out on everything you want and then suddenly fast the next day. No, you prepare the body for the fast. So the day before, actually two days before the fast, you cut out all refined foods. The day before the fast, no, no greased foods, no frying. Reduce your cooked food, simple. Only raw foods, literally the day before, and then you fast. When you're coming out of the fast, again, when you come out of a fast, you, your next meal should be very simple, raw. And then thereafter, you build back up into your normal diet. So don't just suddenly start and stop a fast. Great. Thank you. Um, the next question, someone said, if, you're, if they're getting stomach pains and tests aren't showing anything, what would you then recommend is they specifically talked about colonoscopy but would you recommend in general fine the bible says the curse causeless does not come so pain is an indicator that something has gone wrong so i would recommend that they try to find out uh, all right let me let me backtrack on that a little bit Clinical science compared to all other sciences is really backward, totally backward. By this, I mean, when you look at physics, when you look at chemistry, we're dealing with matter at the subatomic level of quarks, protons, and really tiny things. Whereas clinical science, we're still dealing with cells, blood cells and biopsies. So 
I can f- know, you know yourself, you know you're not feeling well, but at the cellular level, nothing shows up because what's happening, the damage has been done at the molecular level. So what I would do is I would um, suggest that that person think about what was happening in their life at about the time these pains came. What emotional or physical traumas may have occurred? Did they get a fall? Uh, Did they get a a, a traumatic piece of news? Um, I would also advise that the person looks into what laws of nature have I transgressed and need to ask God forgiveness for and help because medical tests often don't show up something until it's really gone too far often not always thank you um someone has mentioned that you said that hot teas are not good to drink however the chinese culture is known to have hot water first thing in the morning, and this is uh, said to be one of the contributing factors to their long life. Okay, number one, I didn't say that. Uh, I didn't say that. I read to you from um, the writing of Ellen White, which I personally believe is inspired by God. Uh, What she did actually say was very hot. Uh, So, We're talking about tea that is hot enough to damage the delicate lining of our digestive system, the mucosal membrane. Um, I don't know, I've not read about, I read that the Chinese longevity is um, attributed to more than just drinking hot tea. It's their lifestyle, their simple foods, and they don't use, um, yeah. But yeah, so definitely you do, I do believe in drinking um, tea, but it's not scalding. Great. Um, someone has said, what advice do you have for a female in their thirties dealing with lupus? I beg your pardon, what, what advice for? A female in their thirties uh-huh. who uh-huh. is dealing with lupus. With lupus? Yes. Uh, right, so I, this is a very, lupus is a very, is a complicated autoimmune condition, uh, which therefore tells me that the immune system has been derailed. So I'm, assu- I'm assuming since the person's got a diagnosis that they are under the care of their doctor. My advice would be, so make sure that she's under, the, that she remains under the care of the doctor, but that she takes an active part remember the order in which uh, Ellen White says we should tackle disease number one she says is ascertain what the cause is number two remove yourself from any unhealthy conditions or environments number three rectify any bad habits now then we we uh, try to um, remedy it So my advice is to eat food as natural as possible, its natural state as possible, to eat regularly and to, um, what would I say, stay close to God and ask God specifically to direct her mind to what could be the cause and how he wants her to remedy this. You know, God doesn't just remember, as I said before, God doesn't want us to manage our illnesses. He wants to cure them. He wants your body to be a testimony of his healing power. And yes, we can glorify God uh, in being sick, but we glorify him so much better when he heals us. So my advice is to follow the laws of health and to seek the advice of a health professional, work closely also with her doctor. Thank you. So coming up to the last uh, few questions, um, someone has asked, do you eat, do you only eat two meals a day? At what times do you eat? Do you keep that routine the same every day? 
And then yes. I'll just put this one at the end. Um, how is aloe vera gel used as a drink? Right. Um, yes, uh, two meals a day is, you we really don't need more than two meals a day, two good meals a day. But of course, the requirement of, of a construction, a young strapping construction worker is uh, the meal requirement is different to that of, let's say, a desk, a petite desk worker. But having said that, the difference is mainly in the quantity of food that is consumed. And a lot of people actually experience a lot more energy. Uh, what time would you have the two meals a day? Well, it depends on your routine. If you have a normal um, time when you sort of wake up and you have your breakfast, and that's, a, and that's a big meal. And then you have uh, another big meal, maybe four hours, five hours later. You might, that's it really. You might maybe want to uh, have a little uh, soup or cup of tea later. If you're a shift worker, those times would vary. So as I said, a lot of shift workers, they come in and they're tired. So they won't eat, they'll go to bed first. And then on rising, then they would eat their two meals a day. Did you ask me another part to that question? Um, the second part was, how is the uh, aloe vera gel used as a drink? Right, so aloe vera gel. You can, underneath the, aloe, underneath the plant, you've got this kind of a yellowish liquid right underneath the cuticle of the leaf. It depends, if you're using it for, as a laxative, you want the liquid part, and that's quite cathartic. That's quite bitter. If you want to use the gel, which is what I think the question is, to help heal the gut, you need to rinse off the, that liquid because the liquid will actually irritate. So those with uh, irritable bowel disease, and sorry, not irritable, inflammatory bowel disease, they wouldn't do well with using that part of the aloe vera gel. Just So when you've got it, so it's the clear uh, solid gel, just put it in your blender, blend it up with your smoothie, or you can just chew it. Great, thank you. So we're gonna bring this session to a close. So the last question is going to be, uh, how can people contact you? So. Someone has asked, where is your practice space and do you facilitate herbal medicine students? And then I'll mix that with, do you have a contact detail? So for those who have very specific questions about maybe their lifestyle or yes. to help others, can they yes. contact you directly? Right. What I'm going, yes, they can. What I'm going to do, because this is on YouTube and what have you, I think I, I will let, I will give you, you as the personal ministry's health leader, Gabriella, I will give you my details. Yes. And you can pass Fine. it on to the relevant persons. Yes, I do see people um, with specific health conditions. And I can be contacted. And if you, um, whoever needs to, if you get in touch with Hampstead Seventh-day Adventist Church, I will leave my details with the health ministry leader there. And she will be happy to pass it on to you. Yeah, so I've written the health ministries um, Gmail in the chat. So if anyone would like uh, Sister Marcy's contact details, you are welcome to send an email. Um, and we will, I will then pass on Sister Marcy's details to you so you can contact her directly. Great, so if you don't mind closing with the prayer, Sister Marcia, and we will end this session and open um, the chat once we have come off live for people to just talk and I guess, share their week and just say hello to you. Fine, let's just bow our heads. Oh, most kind and holy Father in heaven, how good, how great, how wonderful you are to create for us a day of rest. Father in heaven, we praise you and we thank you for the grace you have given us, the light you have shown us, the laws of health you have given us so that we can cooperate with you in reflecting your divine and holy image. Father in heaven, 
I know this has been a lot of information and I know the human spirit we balk because that's what we do. But I pray you'll help us, Lord, help us in our weaknesses, grant to us a desire and a hungering for truth. Father, when we consider the extent to which you went to save our souls, and all you ask us to do is to accept your light so that you can work in us a new creation. We are humbled. Lord, as you are finishing up the work of judgment in the heavenly sanctuary, even as we speak, as you are preparing to pour out your Holy Spirit in the loud cry, May we, like children of Israel of old, humble ourselves before you with true heart searching so that we may be ready to be able to um, stand before you when you come and to avoid all the things that are happening in this world to come out of Babylon. I praise you and thank you, Lord, for the work of Hampstead, for the health ministry team. I praise you and thank you for your glorious truth. Lord, bless every head that's bowed here, every family that's represented. Thank you again for hearing and answering these our prayers in the name of Jesus. Amen.